Real estate and gold. A few years back, I could have said with confidence that these are two investments that every Indian will swear by. This paradigm has changed quite dramatically over the past few years. And almost everyone is talking about financialization, about investors rushing into the stock markets. But we're talking about real estate once again because of what happened a short while back in the union budget. The treatment of long-term capital gains on real estate changed along with everything else. Indexation was removed, there was a hue and cry, and then it's been rolled back. But that's only on property that was bought before the 23rd of July this year. Should you buy a house as an investment? That's the big decision we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Joining me on this conversation to help you make that decision is Anush Puri, chairman and founder of Anrock Property Consultants, and Santosh Joseph, founder of Germinate Investor Services. Thanks so much, gentlemen, for taking the time. Thank you very much. So let's start with a conversation about uh, what has changed, because a lot of people are focusing on the indexation removal that has been rolled back, but then it is prospectively changed, Anuj. How dramatic is that? Uh, so Alex, uh, first of all, delight to be on your show. And uh, you know it's always a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I would say two parts to it is, uh, one, I must give credit to this government, to the Honorable Finance Minister, uh, because, Alex, two things. Uh, one, they did roll back very quickly, at least the grandfathering period mm. that they're doing it. Second is, uh, I think they understood that this is largely an impact that is going to happen to the middle class families. Mm. And suddenly the middle class is now going to be paying a lot more on the long term capital gains uh, if we don't grandfather mm. it. I, I think people are OK going forward if you've made a change. Mm. Now, going forward, if the property market remains in this bull run, mm. you know, where we are seeing between 11 to 13 percent price appreciation year on year, mm. uh, then actually it is sort positive. of positive, beneficial, because you're paying a, a much lower tax instead of 20 percent long term uh, long term capital gain, you're paying 12 and a half percent. So indexation really doesn't help. Uh, in that, that was the mathematics that we were looking at, right? Santosh, you, you had done, a lot of people had done that math. If you were above 10%, 11% in certain situations, if you look at the time frame, then you're better off without the indexation. I right? think everyone has got their math right. You know, there was a certain <laughs> number at which this new indexation would work, which means you're not looking for an exorbitant return on investment. You're looking for that good, if you're making that 12 to 15% return, you're actually very good over here. Uh, in, in this case that we just spoke about, one of the reasons the grandfathering of indexation benefited was a lot of people who had made investment, and especially the longer term guys, mm. almost 15 to 20 year gap, that's where bulk of the returns were nested. Mm. Now, you didn't want that to be taxed adversely. Now, that uh, being removed is a relief for the people who made investments earlier. Now, the guys who are going to make it into the future, and I think even the expectation is, you know, you know we all are, have to be practical that it's toned down. So in that scenario, this taxation is favorable. Okay, so uh, I must admit that we've had this conversation multiple times. In fact, Anuj, you and me, I have more gray hair in my, uh, on, on my head. Uh, you look the same, um, I must say. Uh, but eight years back, we were talking about just this. Uh, can investment into real estate still be justified? Uh, and I'm hoping over the course of this conversation that we can establish that fact. We've seen major appreciation over the last few years, part of it because of COVID-19. But the reality is that over the longer term, it's been a little hard to make the argument for real estate as an investment rather than other things. Has anything changed? So Alex, uh, you're absolutely right. We've had this discussion earlier, but that was seven, eight years ago. And I maintain that part today as well. Mm that uh, there are two parts to real estate. Uh, you know, one part is from an investor perspective. And if, uh, Alex, you think is that the investor is going to make money on residential, I dare say mm. you're going to make, uh, you know, if you're an investor, then I would say, please do not invest in residential. You're not going to be able to make the returns that you can make in other instruments. Mm. But if you are an investor who's willing to invest in REITs, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, publicly listed uh, stocks of the developers, yeah. or for that matter, hard commercial asset, 
then Alex, it's a fantastic proposition for the investors mm. because hard assets, you know, you get between seven and a half to eight percent unlevered mm. return. Mm. If you lever it, you know, it's say 11, 12 percent. And I'm not even taking into account capital appreciation. This is only the rental yield income mm. that you are able to get on mm. uh, there. So clearly, if you are an investor, I would say is look at more commercial. Mm. Don't get tempted on residential. Mm. Yes, we've had a big bull run. Mm. on the residential, but I dare say that we're going to see this bull run that we've had on the increase in the property prices. I think the bull run will continue as far as the sales momentum is concerned. Mm. Uh, but continuous increase of the price over the last sort of four years, we've seen uh, you know, every year between 11 to 13 percent increase in the price, unlikely that to is continue. going to, to continue. And the reason that we saw that was because the period prior to that, Alex, say from 2013 to 19, hmm. we'd seen about three, three and a half percent price rise. I, I see Santosh <laughs> nodding his head uh, very, uh, you know, evocatively, and he's he's got the numbers to back that up because I know that for a fact. We were talking about a study that you looked at, I believe, between 2011 and 2022. The, the, the RBI anyone? data yeah. on the housing price index itself is a very telling sign. Mm. So let's say between 2012 to 2013, and you take a 10 year period till about 21, 22, um, uh, just around the time when the inflection point of the post COVID world began, mm. we did not even generate a four to 5% annualized growth over a 10 year period. Now, for anybody who made an investment into residential real estate for a 10 year period, you had to go through a tough part. Mm. Now, the last two to three years have just been a one-way climb. Yeah. That has corrected the last 10 odd years uh, CAGR returns. Therefore, I couldn't agree more to what he was just saying that even in real estate, even in residential, the returns are so lumpy, you, you come into the asset class thinking that you're going to make stable and sure returns, mm. but you get a completely different experience. We were talking just before the show and you were alluding to a study that was done, uh, an economic study that was done studying various asset classes and the convergence of that. Can you explain how that has come to pass? See, this is a Nobel Prize winning uh, study about the study of asset prices and the, the asset classes. Now you take asset classes globally in, in largely developed markets where you have a lot more data points than what we have domestically here. You take equity, you take fixed income, you take bonds, you take real estate, right? When you do a large study over three, four, five, maybe even six decades, when you have that kind of good data, quality data, actually the prices converge with a two to three percent or sometimes two percent margin of difference mm. now what does it tell you that all the stuff that we talk about that one asset class can make you rich one asset class can you know put you back is wrong over a period of time asset classes deliver what they're supposed to deliver mm. one number two some of us have the luxury of within the asset classes playing around so therefore a real estate developer He's got a completely different set of advantage than a real estate investor mm. because there he's not stuck to a asset but he's dealing with the asset class as a whole changing from property to property moving on and producing value mm. whereas an investor he's locking in his money and waiting for value to appreciate over a period of time so therefore what does it tell you that we're not in a binary game we know that there is money to be made over asset classes and if you're a long enough investor you'll do well for yourself and de-risk your portfolio mm -hmm. i think that's the key takeaway that one assets will deliver what they're supposed to deliver not more not less number two de-risking becomes extremely important and finally you also have to know how you enter the uh, the game a developer is way different from an investor in terms of making money in real estate mm. to that end we've spoken about price appreciation anuj but we've also got to speak about the rental yields because in certain pockets, and I'm talking about this from the perspective of somebody that rents, I've seen rents in the space that I live go up as much as 30, 40% in the span of just two years. And that's, I think, the case in several pockets in real estate across the board, right? So has the paradigm shifted for people that are looking to buy and put property on rent, or is this something of a passing phase that will settle down? Um, so not not as much, uh, Alex. Even today, if you were to look at the residential yields on the rental, it's sort of two and a half percent, sure. maybe inching towards three. Yeah. Not attractive mm -hmm. for an investor unless you add capital appreciation. Yes. You know, capital appreciation has been pretty smart, as I said, is you know eleven to thirteen percent over yeah. the last uh, you know three four years. Then you add the two together, rental plus capital. Then it has a very compelling uh, proposition for an investor. 
uh, to to buy. But otherwise, pure rental yields for residential will not excite the investor. And yes, the rentals have gone up. But you know, Alex, uh, with the same proportion, the capital values have also gone up. Mm. So as a result of it, your yields, you know, used to be two percent, are now inching towards three percent, but not as attractive. If you go into the commercial assets, mm. you know, you're talking about eight percent. Wow. So you know, suddenly in, in what markets? Uh, in all the major markets, uh, you know, all the sort of six, seven top cities. If you were to look at it, you know, Bangalore, Bombay, NCR, Pune, Hyderabad, Chennai. And these are for a particular size of property or across the board? These are largely big offices. Okay. Uh, where you know you will have uh, either private equity playing in, you will have family offices playing in, you will have high net worth individuals. Uh, so you know, I'm saying ticket size between sort of 50 crores going onwards to say a thousand crore. So that's no avenue for the retail investor to invest in. Then, Alex, you look at the REIT, REITs, right? Because that is a fantastic proposition. Sure. You know, from the perspective what uh, SEBI has been able to do it, and you know, you've got now what four REITs yeah. uh, in India. One of them is a retail. The other three are on the office side, and uh, and not only that, you know, there and is there's this one on the retail side also that's coming. That is right? one on the retail. Yeah. So three office. So the one on the retail is Nexus, yeah. uh, which Blackstone yeah. has, and the other three are all on the office side. But there is one other thing, uh, Alex, that SEBI has brought in, which is the fractional ownership. The micro, yeah, the, the micro uh, reads, right? the micro reads yeah. uh, in there. So you know, you as an investor, you can if if you're not wanting to buy a large ticket, you know, size for the office, you can look at a REIT market, or you can look at fractional. Or now that the uh, sort of SME REITs are going to come in, you can look at picking up those. When we were talking about capital gains and the change in the treatment of capital gains, a lot of people focused on the initial acquisition cost, but really, 90%, I would say, and maybe even more than that, buyers of real estate, residential real estate, do so with leverage, with taking on a loan, and they don't necessarily count the cost of interest, which doubles the cost of the acquisition of the property over a 15, 20 year period. How do you calculate the overall cost? Well, I think it's nice that we're talking about the total cost of ownership here yeah. because it's often ignored and actually puts a lot of home buyers also in stress because mm -hmm. the cost that you arrive at to buy the property is the only beginning. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out the legal costs, you have to figure out the brokerage and the commission costs that you have to buy the property yeah. and, the then, and then the stamp duty, yeah. the registration costs. Now, at that level, you're still only securing your title. What about doing up the place? You know, most developers give you a bare shell or a warm shell, and you've got to make it livable. And that's easily 20, 25% of the cost of the property if you want to do it up well. In some cities, you spend a lot more on doing up the property than just the property in itself. At that level, you're ready to start living in. Now, when you start living in, you the property taxes start kicking in. It again depends on the kind of property, the size of the property and the amenities that you're, uh, the maintenance to the society, the taxes that you pay and the repairs and maintenance. Now, when you actually look at this, you realize that the real estate investment that you made actually exacts a value from you mm. that you have to pay every year for proper upkeep, maintenance and clear titles. Remember, you can't go without not paying taxes. Yes. There is a holding tax. There is a holding maintenance cost. Now, how many of us are able to input that to calculate your actual IRR on the property? So in your opinion, how much? OK, of course, this would depend on the on the on the area. But in your opinion, how much would that reduce the IRR? Uh, and here we're talking about the rate of return that you would get over a period of time, right? So how much would you have to sacrifice on that? See, very broadly, even if it depends on the kind of the property and the city that you live in, uh, one to 2% is easily shaved off just for the costs and the maintenance of the property. Now, don't forget that it's just not only the little bit costs that come once in a way, but if ever there's a home improvement. And essentially, when you want to sell the property, it has to look good to also extract value, right? So everything is a cost. And at some level, it will eat up into the value of the overall return that you get because you have to keep it in good shape to also good, get good value and also to realize good value. Okay. I, I want to talk about uh, the uh, amount of volume that you have and particularly in places like Mumbai, what we're seeing, Anuj, and maybe you can talk about this a little bit more, the pure amount of supply that is coming through even from redevelopment, right? Because you have so many old properties that are going into redevelopment the sheer amount of supply that is coming to the market, what is that going to do to the prices of real estate? We've seen tremendous appreciation. Correct. You mentioned that that's unlikely to take place, but could you ever see a fall in prices? 
Um, so I'm going to take it from where Santosh left uh, uh, Alex, uh, because Santosh articulated beautifully on the residential part. Mm. You know, on the commercial, if you're an investor, actually it makes sense to you because majority of the expenses like uh, Santosh enumerated, you actually pass them on to the to tenant, the, yeah. to the occupier. I mean, so your maintenance is paid by the occupier, you know, your property taxes, sure. et cetera, et cetera. You are able to pass that on. So, so he's absolutely right is that on the residential, perhaps it doesn't make sense for an investor absolutely. Uh, to come in is. But for office or warehousing or data center or industrial, Alex, it's a fantastic proposition. Why I want to retrade is because your viewers will We'll, we'll see a lot of the HNIs, family offices, equity funds wanting to buy into these mm. because clearly the rental yields are quite pronounced yeah. and and you know far greater than two two and a half percent versus you're talking eight sort of eight percent. plus yeah. percent and eight plus also unlevered mm. plus it does not include capital appreciation mm. so you know clearly from that perspective but just to answer the question that you asked uh, you know in Bombay in the past thirty years I've seen Alex on paper there is always supply. you know supply. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that happened. In actual practice, it doesn't. Even if you were to take the society redevelopment, which is really what is being talked about, that is going to bring in a huge amount of supply. In actual practice, by the time that supply really comes in, you know, we think is that it's going to be one or two years. It's probably four or five years because you have to get all the consent of the society members. You have to, you know, get them vacated. Just vacation itself is a process uh, which could be, you know, up to a year before you are able to so bring it. So you there's enough time for absorption So there is enough time for absorption because on paper it's an ideal scenario that mm -hmm. we're going to be able to get uh, everything, you know, pretty quickly done. But by the time in actual practice the supply comes in, takes that much more longer. And in, in particularly the society redevelopment, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm seeing that uh, across a number of societies in Bombay where the developers had expected that the supply, they'll be able to hit the market mm -hmm. far more quicker for some reason or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, that has got delayed whether you know the society members themselves are not able to see eye to eye mm. or just because a few society members are saying is look you know it's my sort of kids 10th board exam mm. I cannot at this moment in time relocate and or, or older people or that older are saying people they don't as well want to move. yeah that's right so it is in my my view the supply and demand situation I do genuinely want supply to come up in Bombay otherwise you know if supply doesn't come in and the demand continues to remain the way robust demand today it is uh, I just fear is that the prices will start to rise very sharply I have a slight uh, a bit of a technique maybe you can weigh, weigh in on this as well uh, but it's been said that it's it's a little difficult to get rid of uh, a house in the secondary market often people particularly because of the kind of supply that is coming through Anuj they prefer to buy a, a, a new house, right? A new building, something that's just coming up, even if it's ready to move in. That's they true. won't go into a property that's 20 years old, 25 years old. It's hard to get it off. Yes. And even if you do, you're going to have to shave off, what, 20% on the, on the uh, price that is being quoted. So from that perspective, if your house is going in for redevelopment, should you use that opportunity to sell? 100% you should stay. Oh, you should stay. You should stay okay. and benefit from the society redevelopment. Okay. If you think is that the society is now sort of almost there, because there is a huge upside that you get from the developer, okay. because you get a much larger area, Alex, you get perhaps uh, money as well. Mm. You also get capital mm. to maintain and run the building. Plus, why people are relocating from the older buildings is they want bigger. Mm -hmm. So the developer is now able to give you bigger. Yeah. They want better. It's brand new. They want facilities, more facilities. The new guy who's coming in is not doing it for the society, yeah. but they're doing it for the free sale yes. area. They want gated community. Largely, these societies are much uh, larger. As a result of which, what you were going to get in if you were to move to a newer building, you you're more. actually getting more and within the same social fabric so, where you are. Okay, so then I'll ask a slightly different question. Santosh, I'm sure that you advise people on this as well. People come to you and say, hey, you know what, I have this old property, or maybe I've inherited a property. Um, it's a little chunky. It's taking up too much of the assets that I own. You don't want to have so much of your money locked in a particular asset that's not necessarily generating more than two and a half, as Anuj pointed out, of yield per year. If you are trying to get rid of it, should you aggressively look for a seller? Uh, absolutely yes and I th especially if uh, you have uh, held the property for some time it makes sense to aggressively exit and look for better opportunities now while we are talking about the last point that you made 
Today, I think the residential housing market is largely dependent on the facilities and the amenities that you provide. That's why a 20, 25 year old property is finding difficult for secondary sale. Yes. People who are buying homes for the first time or upgrading their lifestyle, they want every bell and whistle included into the property. Yes. From the clubhouse to the swimming pool to the children play area to the seniors uh, living area and everything. They w and especially they're willing to pay, they want all the benefits and they do not want a 15, 20 year old with a creaky lift or maybe a building that doesn't look good from the exterior. They want everything to look nice. Now, for the person who's not happy with the rental yield and has also got a large part of his net worth stuck in some piece of real estate. It's just a sound decision mm. to unlock value, to buy something that is more prevalent and relevant for today. Mm. Now, not to forget that here is where you have an opportunity to think and reconsider your decision. What do I want? Mm. Do I want to move my net worth from A, the exact piece of real estate to exact piece of real estate or can I unlock some, create a financial piece of investment and asset and then also have another secondary piece of real estate where I can actually live in, mm. which is a consumption need. Yeah. And there's an interesting data now for the last two to three years, instead of buying any real estate apartment, now I'm not saying you shouldn't buy, we all need homes to live in and that's why the demand is so robust. Yes. And which clearly said that 30 years, uh, thanks to the robust uh, supply, the prices have more or less remained sane. Yeah. Now, having said that, any listed developer of any city, had you bought their stock over the last two or three years, you made almost double the money of the appreciation <laughs> of the property and no stress, the liquidity has been very high, easy to buy, easy to sell, no paperwork, no title deed, no maintenance, and also relatively low capital gain tax on the gains that you made. Yeah. So therein lies the opportunity that we're not talking about a binary outcome. We're saying we all need that one comfortable home that all of us have to live in. Okay, so we've established at this point, both of you all have said more or less the same thing. You've pointed out that the opportunities for the investor exist in commercial real estate and in fractional ownership of real estate. And you've pointed out also that financialized assets in the real estate space are better to invest in. From a financial planning perspective and having this as part of your portfolio, it does make sense. Nobody's saying no. But how much do you restrict it to? There are thumb rules, of course, depends on your risk-taking ability and all of those other factors. But how much should it not be more than as a part of your portfolio? So the interesting part is when real estate is actually done, it becomes a good foundation for people then to move up the risk chain. Sure. Because traditionally in India, we've seen real estate as a stable asset. Mm -hmm. Not to forget that this was one of the primary assets that we all grew up with where our parents or people before our generation had access to. But the options, uh, other options did not We're very limited. Yeah. So therefore they built their net worth on real estate. Yes. Today, the fortunate thing that the younger generation has got is they use the real estate that parents have got or they've inherited, use that to create a foundation to build non-real estate based financial assets. So therefore, the typical thumb rule is that if you have already got it, now whether that property is big or small, then it becomes either a 20% of your portfolio per net worth or 60% of your net yes. worth. Whatever the the proportion is, then you start adding financial assets to it. If you're building everything new, then normally you'd go with 20-30% being on the higher end of your physical assets, which is real estate. Or if you already got it, then you start aggressively building towards financial assets. But in any which case, you would like to strike a balance that this is at least one third of your overall net worth and not more. But as your portfolio size grows, this one third also will start shrinking and it'll become just the part that you need to number one, consume, number two, have just an extra edge or exposure to real estate. Okay, closing comments, couple of questions for each of you. One, uh, Anuj, in your opinion, which commercial real estate market in India is looking the most promising and why? By a large, large margin, I would say is Bangalore. Okay. I, I mean, look, we believe that uh, this calendar year, Alex, 2024, will be the best ever that India has seen on office leasing, mm. best ever. Uh, and and nearly a third of that leasing is going to be Bangalore. So Bangalore is super vibrant. Uh, all your GCCs, the global capability centers, you know, Indian startups, just a lot of the corporates are on the IT tech side going into Bangalore. And which REITs have the most exposure to Bangalore? Uh, embassy has. I, I mean, they have, they have the largest exposure is uh, of uh, embassy REIT is in uh, is in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. So I would say is that market is the most vibrant, and uh, and and also that market has been very stable 
plus also you have not seen rental growth mm. going crazy mm. which is which is good from an occupier's perspective yeah. the quality of the buildings are nice they are delivered on time the quality of the developers are very ethical mm. very professional and the market is humongous because if one third of your total leasing activity for india is bangalore then i would say bangalore is a great place to go out and and sort of buy uh, if you are an investor i do want to however point out uh, alex is that um, on the residential side we are running at a 15 year high yes. in terms of demand yeah. but it is largely by the end users yes okay so to that point and this is a question for the end user because we've established at this point that it does not necessarily make financial sense to invest in real estate as a, a residential property if you are taking a loan what specific advice just to close out this conversation because most of my viewers will either have or are contemplating getting a house on loan um what advice would you give to reduce the implication of that interest cost so first and foremost actually for most people taking a loan to buy a residential property is maybe one of the wisest things that you can do mm -hmm. because you're using leverage as a tool to build an asset which has got the potential to appreciate over a period of time and normally over time these tend to iron out and give you uh, a good return yeah. therefore with consumption with the with the leverage that you do and buying a home that you need today and living in it it's a great benefit now lot lo lot of times people are a little confused whether i should prepay the loan not prepay the loan what rate to take whether i should take fixed or floating mm. now the simpler way to go about is you take the loan to figure out how you can spread it over 15 or 20 years if you do have the money to pay it back consider do i pay it back or do i reinvest this money also to build financial assets mm, sure. alongside the way because then you're creating a double engine for yourself which mm. is real estate and also financial assets there will be a point of time when you'll have a windfall at that particular problem you can look, look at reducing or pairing your debt which then will increase and make your net worth more robust but the point is buying real estate in a city uh, that you like or you want and and you know you 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 will see the benefit of appreciation the benefit of you know that a good part of stable uh, portfolio being also sorted is all a great way to you know buy a residential home on loan and make it work for you yeah and maybe utilize some of the gains that you've had in the financial markets to do that <laughs> thank you so much yes. gentlemen for taking the time it's been an absolute pleasure bringing you this episode of big decisions let us know what you think in the comments and do stay tuned lots more coming up on ndtv profit